Coming up on One Detroit, Michigan and the country deals with the coronavirus pandemic, how life has changed, and the stories that reflect that. Stay with us. One Detroit is coming up. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. And thank you to these supporters. And viewers like you. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald and welcome to my home. This is where we're going to be broadcasting from for the foreseeable future. We are just like you. We're home, social distancing, only going out for essentials and following the guidelines of the state. These are difficult and unsettling times. And while we know that you're following the latest news, the latest numbers, and we're not a breaking news organization, but Detroit Public Television and One Detroit has always worked very hard to reflect what's happening in our neighborhoods, in our area, and the impact of this pandemic is really no different. So we have a show for you collected of all the interviews we've been doing each and every day and posting onto OneDetroitPBS.org and across our social media platforms. It really tells the story of our area in an unprecedented time. So coming up, I spoke with Ron Bartell, who is the owner of Cuzzo's Chicken and Waffles over on the city's west side on the Avenue of Fashion. He really gives us a sense of what small business owners are going through at this time. Then we're going to tackle the serious issue of verbal and physical attacks on Asian Americans around the country, discrimination and hate over the coronavirus. And then for parents like me, how to talk to our kids, ease their anxiety, and deal with the new normal of being home. And then we are going to end on a light note because music really heals the soul. You know, many restaurants are trying to survive right now with carry out and with delivery. And we really wanted to see how people were doing. So joining me now is Ron Bartel. He's the owner of Cuzzo's Chicken and Waffles on the famous Avenue of Fashion on the city's west side. Hey, Ron. Hey, how you doing? Doing all right. Tell me how you guys are doing. Uh, we're making it. Uh, we're making it. You know, we pretty much had to switch business models midstream you know you were used to dine-in um, liquor sales and all those things that make the business go to have to cut those things off in order just to survive um, it's, it's it's been tr it's been tough it's been tough I think it's been especially tough for you guys because you closed down in August of, of 2019 for renovation and also there's a huge construction project on Livernoy you just opened back up on March 14th um, so what is that what has that been like it's been rough. It's been rough. Um, it's been rough to see a lot of the businesses in the area close, um, especially during this time of the year when the anticipation was the weather was breaking, the streetscape had been done, people had made it through the storm just to get hit over the head with this pandemic. Uh, for us as a business, it's, it's been rough as well. Um, you know, having to lay off people, um, you know, people livelihoods are, you know, they, a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck. And having to make those tough decisions, um, you know, just because of things that are out of our control, quite frankly. How many people did you have to let go? Oh, man, we let go of, I think, 25 people. Around 25. And it's hard to be able to say if and when you'll be able to bring them back. So what kind of crew are you working with right now? Skeleton crew. <laughs> Skeleton mm -hmm. crew. Um, we probably kept around 12, 15 staff members. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're working, we're open seven days a week, two shifts. Um, we're running about six people per shift. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just trying to make just trying to make it so you know, we can keep doors open uh, and keep paychecks coming for people, quite honestly, at this point. A limited menu as well? 
Yeah, yeah, we limited our menu, um, went straight to carry out call-ins, uh, mobile, mobile delivery app. Um, we're thinking about doing some things a little bit different, offering family-style meals, seeing as how families are sitting at home. Um, you know, so yeah, we're just making adjustments as we go. Everything is so fluid. You know, when you talk about um, you're, you're living this right now and so many other businesses up and down the stretch of where you are on Livernois are living it as well. Um, and you look at how much you have maybe in reserve to be able to get through a time like this. You're not the only one in this situation. What conversations are you having with other small business owners about what kind of help you may, you may need to have, not only from the city of Detroit, but federal government? Uh, people are scared. They're worried. Um, for instance, my uncle owns four uh, retail stores in the area. He has to shut doors for each and one of them. He doesn't know if he'll be able to reopen after this. Um, you know, he's an older gentleman, so you know, I'm trying to get him, um, talk to him about the idea of SBA loans and things of that nature. Um, but you know, we, we, people need a lifeline. You know, a lot of these businesses are week to week, to be perfectly honest. Um, they can't go a month, two months without some type of uh, revenue stream. Um, you know, rent abatement, rent abatement is a, a big deal. Um, you know, um, loan deference is a big deal. Um, cash and, and a cash influx is a big deal. I mean, anything that you could think of is a big deal for small businesses to operate because because the margins are so small. And when you talk about an area that has already dealt with the, the streetscape problem, those margins are even more thin. What are we talking in terms of can you exist and continue on with the way your business is, is scaled right now for the foreseeable future with with your skeleton crew of 12 and being able to do kind of the two services i think we'll i think we'll know that this week i think we'll know that this week uh last week was a shock to the system you know people were still spending a little bit of money but at the end of the day if people aren't working they're not gonna have money to spend so that's what people are worried about. How long will this go on? How long will the everyday worker not be able to go to work and, and get those paychecks? Because you need people need money to spend in order to place food deliveries. Like I said, we're going to keep pushing it as long as uh, we have a staff that wants to work. Because at the end of the day, people's health um, is our priority. We don't want to put anybody in a compromising position for a dollar. I just would not, never do that to people. So as long as we have a crew that's comfortable with working and we feel like we can protect them and the information that we keep receiving from medical officials, from the rest of the hospitality industry, from the state and from the federal government, we'll just keep abiding by those rules as we get them. Um, but sooner or later, we will need a lifeline like everybody else. Uh, your restaurant is a touchstone for the neighborhood. I know you guys have only been there since 2015, but um, the, the having a place in the community and the area around it has grown so much. How would you characterize what this pandemic has 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 done or could do uh, to this area? It could ravage the area. To be perfectly honest, it could it could really ravage the area. Like I said, to come off of that the the, the, the streetscape, which pretty much. <laughs> put people in the hole as is. A lot of people are playing catch up to have this come at a time like this, this time of the year, um, when the spring is breaking, when dollars should be flowing, when businesses should be popping, uh, freedom of movement, you know, um, just to have that cut off at the knees. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's disheartening. Um, so we'll see, you know, right now all you can do is pray, be optimistic, um, believe in leadership um, and, you know, just, do what we can in the meantime, between time to make the ends meet. Uh, you have delivery service and you have it from three services? Yeah, right now we, we've linked up with uh, Uber Eats, uh, DoorDash, and uh, a new delivery service called Black and Mobile. So we're using those. We also um, we also have call-in available, uh, carry-out. Uh, we're thinking about switching to a curbside service soon. So um, we'll be... Uh, linking up with Grubhub pretty soon. And um, yeah, so we're going to link up with every delivery service possible so we could feed as many people as possible so we could pay as many people as possible. When you finish each day, what runs through your mind, Ron? Will we make it to the next day? <laughs> well, how long will we be able to keep this up? Um, are we doing the right thing by staying open? Uh, quite frankly, are we putting people at risk? Um, you know, I take that very, I take that very serious, you know. Um, but you know we've had these open, honest uh, dialogue and conversations with staff. Um, they want to work. They love what they're doing. They're on the front lines. So we want to be able to continue to support them any way that we can. Um, like I said, a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck. This is the country that we live in. This is our society. Um, so it's a catch twenty two. Um, are we more worried about the economy or are we worry about saving lives? So at some point, uh, we have to have a meeting of the minds and, and figure out a way to move this thing forward where everybody can come out of this thing whole. 
Chinese and Asian Americans around the country are increasingly becoming targets of discrimination, even physical attacks, people wrongly blaming them for the spread of the coronavirus. We wanted to see what was happening here in Michigan. So I spoke with Richard Moy. He is the board chair of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote Michigan group, and also Roland Wong. He's an attorney. He teaches Asian American history at the University of Michigan. And he also worked on the Vincent Chin case back in the 80s here in Michigan. Richard, if I could start with you and talk to us a little bit about what people are telling you, um, what members of the Asian American community are telling you, what they're experiencing right now in Michigan in the wake of this, um, and coming also from an administration, a president who has been calling this the Chinese virus. Maybe not so much uh, here in Michigan, but certainly around the country that uh, uh, you have verbal abuse. And just this incident, walking past somebody in the grocery store and they'll, they'll yell coronavirus or uh, call them a name. Um, it, there's been some physical assault, some you know reports of physical assault and uh, being spat upon, and it's just it, it is really unfortunate that uh, we should be focusing on tackling this this pandemic here and keeping it, getting it under control. Um, but unfortunately, some people have taken this opportunity to raise the xenophobia. Well, yesterday, on Monday, uh, President Trump came out, actually, and made a statement saying it's important we totally protect our Asian American community in the United States and, and all around the world. Um, Roland, he can say a statement like that, but if he continues to, to refer to coronavirus COVID-19 as a Chinese virus, what does, that, um, what does that message send? It's kind of a mixed message. It is a mixed message because I think that it, we're better served if we stick to the terms that the CDC has adopted in the World Health Organization and call it COVID-19, uh, just like the Spanish flu in 1918 or uh, other flus that somehow get a name attached to it. It's not helpful for the community that might be targeted because it does play upon the fear or hatred that people may have and it rears its ugly head time and time again whether it's uh, you know during world war ii with internment mm -hmm. with the vincent chin case and the downturn of uh, auto sales in the u.s or now with uh, covid19 it, it's an opportunity for people to uh, exhibit their fear and using a geographical or racial name on a flu merely fans that flame. How would so. you compare the atmosphere that we're living in right now compared to the 80s and after the murder of Vincent Chin when racial animosity towards Asian Americans were really at an all-time high in our area? I'd say the uh, fear in the community is uh, perhaps the same. The view that any one of us could be another target because of the widespread despair about the downturn in the auto industry that affected everybody in the community. Now this coronavirus affects everybody in the community. And so there's, there's that fear of being targeted. And it is uh, based on anecdotal information that we have now. We're busy collecting information about people who are called names, uh, their shopping carts are spat on in the grocery store. We're checking out a case involving a Hmong woman who was uh, you know, yelled at by a butcher, uh, that sort of thing. So it, it's something to take seriously. So Richard, um, when people need to feel safe, do you feel that enough is being done? I mean, we've heard from the Attorney General here in Michigan who has talked about, um, please report any incidents to police or call our hate crimes hotline. Um, is there enough that's being put out there for people to feel safe in some way? I, I would, I'd like to think so. Um, that certainly uh, on social media, again, that um, there's been a stand against the those comments made by President Trump in particular. So um, both in the newspaper articles, uh, on on Twitter, on Facebook as well. And uh, you know, I thought there was a great response to President Trump's uh, protecting the Asian American community by Representative Judy Chu out of California. And her her Twitter response was, well, you know, this wouldn't be necessary if we hadn't started that in the first place. If he hadn't used uh, the term Chinese virus in the first place. I think it's time for our leaders to step up and, you know, have a sense for how their words are 
used and interpreted and words do hurt on occasion and uh, people should realize that uh, the bully pulpit is theirs and they should use it to uh, unify the country uh, in a coronavirus battle not to sort of pick winners and losers. Uh, both of you gentlemen are students of history and you teach history and I'm going to ask both of you and Roland let me start with you how would you characterize um, this time this, this this period in history for the Asian American community? Well it's an opportunity to uh, identify ourselves as people that are part of the solution and people should recognize that Asian American groups are working together to sew face masks and donate them in the right places. Uh, we're all in this together. I think that that should be the message, uh, but we also see that opportunity to identify who are those people who are the, uh, the hateful people that are resentful and uh, you know, call them out on it and uh, let them know there's a hate crime line that uh, you know, is available for people to call them in and uh, people should know. 313-456-0200, that's the hate crime hotline at the Attorney General's office and, uh, and act on that if they see something or say something. Richard, what about you? How would you characterize this time in history? It's a reminder that, uh, you know, I think the, the, you know, the journey towards a more perfect union is, is ongoing. And so it's, it's not a threshold that we cross and, and things are better. And I think, you know, certainly in times of crisis, you can, you can see that uh, some of the, again, xenophobia, some of the racism will rear its head. Um, and that you, you know, you always have to be diligent um, and, and watch out for that and be ready to organize and, and stand for justice. And so it's, it's not, a, uh, not a destination, but a journey, I think, in that sense. And this is a good reminder of that. You know, for families, this is a this is a really difficult time. Um, parents trying to manage their own anxiety with kids that have a lot of questions, and some of those questions parents can't quite understand right now. And keeping everyone calm in an ever changing situation is not always that easy. So we're going to look for a little bit of help here today. And joining me is Dr. Erin Hunter. She's the interim director for the University Center for the Child and Family at the University of Michigan. Hi, Erin. How are you? I'm doing okay. Um, well, you're a clinical psychologist. Um, can you give us an idea of what you have been seeing over the last week and a half and, and some, of the, some of the issues that parents and, and children are bringing to you? This is a really stressful time. And this is a time where I feel like uh, it's very unchartered. And what's hard is then things aren't predictable and we don't know what's coming. So there's just a lot of stress. And I think a lot of stress for families as really the structure of our society has completely changed over the last week. You know, schools are closed and now people are homeschooling. Um, and, you know, I think some of the things that are coming up for kids, I mean, you know, especially related to COVID-19 is, um, you know, am I going to get sick? Is my family going to get sick? What does that mean? I think that those are some of the anxiety for kids. I think the other thing is kids are missing things that used to be in their life, regular contact with their friends, going to school and seeing their teachers, um, activities, so hobbies, clubs, etc. Um, you know, and I think that that is hard on kids and depending on the age, they'll have different levels of understanding of kind of what that is and what's going on. And I think for parents, you know, a lot of things too, how do I keep myself and my family healthy? How do I keep myself and my, and my family sane while we are all stuck here in the house together? How do I manage all these roles where I'm trying to do my job from home, but I'm also now a homeschool teacher and I'm also a cook and a cleaner and you know yeah. a doctor and kind of everything else. And I just think that there's many more demands on families as well as perhaps some anxiety about their jobs. What you said um, really resonated to me in terms of the different levels of understanding. I have three kids and they range in age from elementary, middle, high school. And there is totally different questions coming from, from all three of them. And then the feeling that you've got to make sure it's all working and that it's all working really, really well. Um, how do we manage our anxiety as parents so we're not transferring it and making it even more intense in our kids right now? I think the biggest thing is kind of lowering expectations for yourself, okay. for your kids, and anyone else in your household. I've got two elementary age kids at home and a one-year-old dog. So it's really just about lowering expectations and trying to be realistic. 
what are the demands that you have? How much are you trying to work from home? Um, how much, you know, what is the age of the level of your kids? How much support are they going to need with different things? Because we cannot do it all. And we are going to make mistakes. We are not going to be perfect. Perfect is not possible under the best of circumstances. And I think we can all agree we are not currently in the best of circumstances. Um, so just being kind, patient, and compassionate towards yourself and yeah. towards other in the family. You know, it's really interesting. A lot of the things that have been going around in social media, and that's the way that people are really kind of connecting right now is make the schedule for your children. And uh, from nine to nine thirty, do this. From nine thirty to ten fifteen, do this. And and I, I, I do think that scheduling is is good in terms of routine. But how do we make sure that that schedule doesn't turn into something that's more detrimental? Um, and again, that what you're talking about, that over expectation of of perfection or keeping the trains running on time in a really bizarre time. I will say having a set routine, I think is, is very crucial for kids and families and kind of everyone, because what the routine does, it establishes a sense of predictability in a world that feels a little bit out of control right now. So we want to have a schedule so that we have that predictability to reduce anxiety, but have it be a little bit of a flexible schedule too. And what is realistic? I think the most important thing is that when we become overly rigid with the schedule, then all of a sudden we're become even more stressed. And that stress is gonna be felt by us, the kids. Kids pick up on much more than we even think that they do, not that they always understand it. And they're gonna feel that stress. So the more rigid we are and the more that it's a stressor versus a helper, then it's gonna undermine the whole reason why you have a schedule. And I'm going to come back to my earlier point, lower the expectations. The kids do not need to be excelling at all the academic stuff right now. They need to be continuing to get exposure. They need to read. They need to be doing some math. Um, but this is maybe a time where they could do some independent research projects. Maybe they're really you know, interested in how bridges work. Maybe they're interested in the origin of soap and where that came from. There's, you know, maybe they want to go outside. That You can learn a lot through life and living. And especially for younger kids, they learn a lot through play. So when they're playing, that's not just free time where they're not doing anything. That is really useful time for their brains to be working through things, figuring them out. Um, and so even play itself can be academic. How much do we as parents shield kids from from news or um, from information and I'm not saying be not truthful with them but how much exposure to what what is happening in the world right now is good and bad and, and, and I guess maybe age it really makes a difference there too. Um, age does really make a difference because um, just even in terms of cognitive abilities kids at different ages are going to understand things at a different level particularly abstract concepts like a pandemic like what does that even mean to a five-year-old I do think it's important to address it kids know about this again my kindergartner brought up coronavirus before I even had a chance to bring it up with them sometime last week so this right. is already something that they're aware of kind of no matter their age probably um, and I think it's about giving them enough information and answering their questions but also giving them space to actually ask the questions um, Right, so if they're ready for more, then they will ask for more. Some kids might be overloaded, and if they're not asking more questions, then it might not be the time. But definitely, they are asking. And in general, I would say with all kids to have a little conversation. So this is what coronavirus is. You know that it's an illness that is kind of like other things. The thing is, it's new, so that our bodies haven't had a chance to kind of develop the defensive responses that we usually have to fight off things like the flu. Remember that you had in January when you stayed home for two days. Um, so it's kind of like that. But we need to give we need to give our community time to build up those defenses, which is why we're staying at home right now and why you're not going to school. So it's scary, but it's okay, and we're going to get through it. And that's going to do it for us. We're working on new interviews every day, and you can find those at OneDetroitPBS.org. Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson are working on stories as well. They'll be back too. Make sure you stay with Detroit Public Television. We will keep you informed. We're here for you. All right, so let's end on a little bit of a lighter note because music really heals the soul. Go ahead and take a listen to Paul Watkins. He's the artistic director of the Great Lakes Chamber Music Festival. We'll see you next time. Take care and be well. In the words of Hans Christian Andersen, where words fail, music speaks. And here's one of the great masters, 
Johann Sebastian Bach from his third cello suite in C major. <laughs> You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. And thank you to these supporters. And viewers like you.